The Committee on Environment, Land, Agriculture, and Procurement Reform calls this public hearing to order. It is 9.04 a.m. on Wednesday, September 20th, 2017. Uh, I received some calls that uh, some of the senators are um, still making their way over, but we'll go ahead and proceed. The purpose of this public hearing is to receive testimony on Bill number 161-34LS, introduced by Senator San Augustine, which is an act to transfer lot 5173, known as the Tamuni Multipurpose Field, and a portion of lot 5173, new-3, from the Chamorro Land Trust Inventory to the jurisdiction and responsibility of the Tamuni Mayor's Office. Uh, Bill 166 uh, has been removed from the agenda at the request of the sponsor. Bill 166 was the uh, reorganization of the Guam Land Use Commission. Um, we will also be hearing Bill 170-34-COR introduced by myself. It's an act to relative to designating um, specifying and delineating the area for the Northern Soil and Water Conservation District and the Southern Soil and Water Conservation District. Bill number 171-34, also introduced by myself, is an act to authorize the Governor of Guam to exchange a portion of land reserved for land exchanges for private property needed by the Government of Guam for a ponding basin and finally, Bill Number 172-34 COR, introduced by myself, which is an act to authorize the expenditure of $34,312 from the Chamorro Land Trust Survey and Infrastructure Fund to pay for leasehold improvements on Chamorro Land Trust Commission leased lot 11, block 2, track 10314, municipality of Dedido that is being voluntarily surrendered by the CLTC lessee. Notice of this morning's public hearing was provided to senators, stakeholders, and the local media, as well as published in the Guam Daily Post on September 13th, satisfying the five-day notice, and September 18th, satisfying the 48-hour notice, thus meeting the requirements of the open government law. The committee will continue to receive testimony until 4 p.m. on Wednesday, September 27th. Please address testimony to Senator Thomas Sierra, Chairperson, Committee on Land, um, and can be dropped to the mailboxes here at the legislature or email to office at senatorada.org. Uh, since the sponsor of Bill 161-34, Senator San Augustine, is not here yet, I will go ahead and pass on that bill until he gets here. Um, and we'll go ahead and move on then to Bill 170-34, which is um, relative to designating and specifying deline and delineating the area that separates the Northern Soil and Water Conservation District and the Southern Soil and Water Conservation District. Uh, signing up to uh, provide um, oral testimony is uh, Mr. Ron Laguanya. I have Mr. James. Uh, is it just written testimony you're providing? Or? Okay. Uh, you, you're not going to give oral testimony? Okay, fine. So uh, please go ahead and step forward, and um, we'll, start with, um, we'll start with you. Um, identify yourself. You're the first one on the sign-up list, so uh, we'll start with your uh, testimony. Good morning, Chairman Ada and members of the committee. My name is Jim Hollier, and I'm the Associate Dean and Director of Cooperative Extension Outreach in the College of Natural and Applied Sciences at the University of Guam. We work closely with the soil and water conservation districts. We wholeheartedly support the new delineation line as it will bring clarity to the board election process, which my office oversees. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, before we proceed further, I want to introduce the vice chair for the committee, uh, Senator James Espaldon. Thank you for joining us. Um, Salaguanya. Off a day. Off a day. Um, see Ronald Laguanya too. Guawi Gehlo. My name is Ron Laguanya. I am the chairman of the Northern Soil Water Conservation District. And um, we are in support of the, uh, the Bill 170, 34, 34. And I'll just read my testimony. But before I say, this is on behalf of the Northern and Southern, both the Conservation District support letter. Buenas and off a day, Mr. Chairman Anna and members of the Committee on Environment, Land, Agriculture, and Procurement Reform, the Northern Guam Soil and Water Conservation District and the Southern Guam Soil and Water Conservation District wholeheartedly support Bill 170-34 to de delineate the geologic structural boundary between Northern and Southern Guam. Chapter 71, Title V, Guam Code Annotated provides for two districts between north and south. However, the, the law does not define the boundaries between what constitutes Northern Guam and Southern Guam. In addition, Bill 170-34 will also establish the voting demarcation between the two districts. The soil and water conservation districts are mandated by Public Law 31-125 Point two, codified as Chapter 71, 5 GCA, which is to work in partnership with the University of Guam and all government of Guam entities overseeing local and federal programs established to promote the conservation, development, and the use of soil and water resources of Guam in order to control and prevent soil erosion and flooding and to improve agriculture water management. Moreover, elections of district board members are from active district registry composed of all farmers, farmland owners, or land occupiers, land owners, or leases. The current rules delineating the northern and southern voting district boundaries, which is Route 4, Salankantuntasi, and the Route 1, Hagatnya Bridge, to Route 4, Pago Bay Bridge and is a man-made delineation with no specific foundation relative to soil and water conservation. The published Weary UOG 2007 geologic map and sections of Guam detail what constitutes the geologic structural boundaries between northern and southern halves of our island with the Pago Adelup fault line as demarcation. Therefore, speaking on behalf of the Southern and Northern Soil and Water Conservation Districts, we, the Chairs, wholeheartedly support Bill 170-34 and ask that this esteemed body support and pass this legislative bill. Sincerely, Yenines Benny Chagalaf, Chairman Southern Guam Soil and Water Conservation District, Zangual Sirano Tilawanya, Gehilut Northern Guam Soil and Water Conservation District. Sisus Masi. Sisus Masi. Uh, Senator Spaldon, do you have any questions? Senator San Augustine? Okay. And of course, I want to welcome Senator San Augustine. All right, so I, I don't have any questions, um, but we have. Uh, yeah. Yes, please. I, I do have one question. Again, I'm, yes. I'm a little unfamiliar with the terminolog terminology of the demarcation. Yes, line. sir. What is the Adloop Pago fault? You know, we just finished attending the weary um, training. Uh, last week, Monday, and yesterday, and it clearly defines it by the geological fault line, which is on the northern part is coral limestone, and on the southern is volcanic, and it's right there. All the water lands are up on the north, pretty much on the north, and it shows on the map the dividing line right there, and that's th those are the uh, that's the the uh, that clearly delineates the north and the south. It's as if it's, they, they have the, uh, the, uh, the actual coordinates, which uh, 
I guess it's not stated in here, but yeah, it, but it but is recorded. Ron, just for proximity for, you know, for me as well as perhaps people who don't understand. I yeah. mean, I understand what yes. you're saying, right, in terms of the difference between yes. the, the limestone up north and, of course, the, the different uh, uh, yes. soil types down south. But uh, geographically, yeah. where does it really start the demarcation line? South. Somewhere between, I think, Agate, would it be, sir? Somewhere. I don't have the map with me, but... Okay. Um, but proximity, yeah, I mean, Approximately, you know, maybe back Agate down. Agate down, and then all yeah. the way down south. And yes. then on the eastern shore, it would be around at the uh, Pago Bay area? Yes, yes. Pago so Bay area, kind of yes. And then I'm sure it's not a straight line across. Yes, it, it doesn't, you know. it doesn't, it's not a straight line. Okay. They yeah. have the coordinates, the, the coordinates. Okay. The, I, I guess the, the, the follow-up question of that is that since you know where it is, do the farmers know where it is? When it comes well, to the voting, I mean, yes. one, that's one of the, the issues here. You know, when you get to the voting of who's going to yes. be on the board of the Southern District and of the Northern District, um, how do you intend to be able to delineate that? Yeah, that, that's what's going to be a clear defined line. Once we, if this becomes law, it would show on the map which residents fall under the northern and the southern. And that needs to be straightened out with the Department of Agriculture, okay. I, I believe. And Senator, uh, you raise a good point, and we'll make sure that in the committee report, um, uh, we provide a copy of the, the map that clearly delineates that boundary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Laguana. Yeah, you can see. Okay. All right, so with that then, um, we'll consider Bill 170 is having been uh, duly heard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go ahead and proceed down to uh, Bill 171, uh, and then we're going to go up to the top of the agenda. Uh, Bill 171 is an act to authorize the governor of Guam to exchange a portion of land reserved for land exchanges for private property needed by the government of Guam for a ponding basin. Um, so signing up for this is uh, Mr. Mike Borja, uh, Mayor June Bloss, and Mr. and Mrs. Emma Collado. So please step forward. So we'll start with, um, I'm going to go ahead and defer to, um, I would like to defer to the mayor first. Okay. Good morning, gentlemen, Senators Espaldon and Senators Etta and Senator Sinagstein. It's really great to be here this morning and um, hearing our bill for 171. Honorable. Thomas C. Etta, Chairman, Committee of Environment, Land, Agriculture, and Procurement Reform, for Bill Number 17134, an act to authorize the Governor of Guam to exchange a portion of land pre reserved for the land exchanges for private properties needed for the Government of Guam and for a ponding basin. Senator Etta, Buenas and half a day, we are submitting testimony supporting Bill 17134 entitled an act to authorize the Magalahin Guahan to exchange a portion of the land reserved for the land exchanges with private property that is needed for the government of Guam and Ponding Basin. And for the record, I, the Barragata Mayor, June Blas, as well as starting with Mayor Laguanya, former mayors, Jesse Palican, myself, of course, Vice Mayor, Vicente Leon Guerrero, Jesse Bautista, have always supported land exchange programs on a support is twofold. It resolves the plight that Colado family had faced since 1980s, and it also resolved the problems that caused by the government of Guam when it was allowed to surrounding areas to backfill their lots, <laughs> therefore causing the Colado property to be classified as wet land. Senators Adas and members of the Mina Trentai Quatruna Listatura in Guam for too long the Colado family have waited patiently for the government to correct their mistake, and they have used this private property as a ponding basin 
and not compensate the land owners anything by authorizing the land exchange and the government acquisition of the Colorado property we will immediately work with the Department of Public Works to finally address the flooding that occurs in this area. Since 1987, the flooding in the area has worsened, unheightening the need of the construction of a ponding basin. Because of this, we would like to request that the funding to construct the proposed base, ponding basin also be provided for. More importantly, the, the Barragana Municipal Planning Council of will find that bills numbers 34 and 358 were introduced in the 24th Guam legislature. The legislative history of bill number 358 introduced on August 12, 1997, publicly heard and reported out in the committee back in January 20 of 1998, and has passed in the legislature in Guam on April 27, 1998 and vetoed by the Magalahing Guahan on May 11, 1998. Also, the Senator John C. Salas on the 24th Guam Legislature in a letter Senator to Marcel Camacho on the 20th Guam Legislature, in this letter, Senator Salas stated that the cause of the Colorado plight was in fact caused by the government of Guam and when it allowed the surrounding neighbors to backfill their lots, therefore causing the Colorado property to be classified as wetland. And therefore, on behalf of the Colorado family and the residents of Barragada, especially those residing in the surrounding area, we respectfully request that Mr. Torian Gohan, through the Leadership at Act, favorably on the legislation inclusive of funding to construct a funding basin in public use. Respectfully, Mayor June Blas and Vice Mayor Jesse Bautista. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Mr. Borja. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Senators. My name is Michael Borja. I'm the Director of the Department of Land Management. On Bill Number 171-34, it intends to exchange private property located in Barragata for the Chamorro Land Trust property in Dedido. While the Department of Land Management understands the need for land exchanges in cases of private in the cases of private lands needed for the public good, such as roads, schools, utilities, and the like, this bill intends to exchange marsh private property for a larger size parcel substantially more usable. Lot 2265 Rem 611 in the municipality of Barragada is shown on, on the survey map 327 FY70, and I've included that as an exhibit to my, my uh, written statement. statement. It's approximately 1,115 square meters and is located in an area also known as Espengao. This lot is the result of a probate distribution, instrument number 100984, which subdivided the basic lot uh, called 2265 REM6 into multiple lots and assigned them to the wife and children of the original landowners and to others. The survey map merely divided their property into assignable parts it includes necessary easements, but does not show topography or other land features such as wetlands. In fact, the easement ac ac accessing this subject property only provides access for lots created from the original lot and does not serve others outside of the original basic lot. In a recent site inspection of the property by the Department of Land Management land agents found this property, property to be unoccupied and unused. The improved section of the easement identified on the survey map ended prior to reaching the property, dropping off into an area with standing water. In an examination of the title of this property, the Department of Land Management did an abstract of title, Lot 2265, Rem 611, and it shows numerous transactions over the years. These include nine transfers of ownerships, two separate mortgages, and at least, in at least two occasions, it appears that the grantee may have rescinded their decision on the purchase based on their delayed due diligence of examining the property for what it appears to be. In the case of this bill, the government and the Chamorro Land Trust are being made to exchange unusable land because of its natural conditions and not because of the actions of the government. This was originally a family lot subdivided into many smaller lots without taking into account whether the land being assigned was suitable for use or not. 
Subsequently, it was sold over and over again. The government did not build, near, build a nearby road or a public facility to cause the conditions that this land suffers. Yet the government is being made to take a quarter acre of unusable land and exchange it for a half acre of prime land. On top of that, the Department of Land Management is being made to absorb all costs and labor in this land exchange in which it and the Chamorro Land Trust Commission have nothing to gain but much to lose. The consequence of this bill's passage will have long-term effects as many others may seek similar exchanges and who wouldn't. While the government must care for its people in an assortment of ways, it must be for the common good. This bill serves the interests of one party who may have unwittingly entered into a land purchase without being aware of its conditions. This bill does not serve the common good and should not be further considered. Thank you. I've also ex included in my written testimony uh, four different exhibits of the documents I spoke about. Thank you very much. Mrs. Colotto? Oh, sorry. Good morning, Senators and Chairman Honorable Tomada. Thank you so much for hearing our case. We, Pat and Emma Colado, hope that after today, you will appreciate and understand the difficult journey we have had regarding the situation and will support us in finally resolving it. In the 1980s, we purchased land in Barigada as an investment in our family's future. We did not have very much in those days and hoped that as we continued to work, we would be able to develop it into something that would provide for us. Due to the situation at hand, however, it has done the opposite. Over the years, the properties surrounding our land were developed, and in some cases, the government approved the owners to backfill. While this allowed those owners to continue to build on their properties, it had severe consequences on the future of ours. The backfilling and development quickly converted our property from pristine buildable land into artificial wetland. Unfortunately, we did not learn of this until we began planning our own building project in 1996. As we were preparing to put our land to use, a site visit was conducted by the Guam EPA and U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which determined that our property had in fact been converted into wetlands, which in turn attracted the endangered Mariana Common Morhen, compounding the far problem further. It was at this point we reached out for help from our local government to research and find the best possible solution to our problem. Through a lot of hard work from those serving our communities, three bills were introduced in our behalf. Bill 727 of the 23rd Guam, 23rd Guam Legislature was introduced by Senator Angel Santos, Senator Mark Charfaros, and Senator Vicente Pangilinan. This bill did not pass, but became the groundwork for the next Bill 34 of the 24th Legislature was also introduced by Senator Angel Santos. These two did not pass through the legislature but helped formulate a third bill which would finally pass. Bill 358 of the 24th legislature was introduced by Senator John Camacho Salas, Senator Edward, Edward Cruz, and Senator Felix Camacho on, on October 20, 1997. In, in it, the findings of the Committee on Agriculture, Land, Housing, Community, and Human Resources Development stated that the artificial wet wetland situation was in fact created by the government of Guam by allowing the backfilling of surrounding properties, and that they were satisfied by the government of Guam caused this situation and not the landowner through any fault of their own. Much to our gratitude, Bill 358 was passed through the, Guam through the 24th Guam Legislature with support from several members who, who are still serving our island today. We wish we could say this was the end. However, we would not be here today asking for your help again as if it was. Even with the support of the 24th Guam Legislature, 
Governor Gutierrez vetoed the land exchange for seemingly political reasons with little regard to our family or our future. After coming so far and having the hard work and support from so many good people, we were beyond disappointed. For two decades, we have continued to have the decision hanging over us. We have continued to pay taxes on land we cannot use. The land and develop as a proper basin has continued to cause flooding and damage to neighboring properties. All the while, we had we have hoped and prayed for a resolution. Today, with Bill 171-34, we have another chance to put right this, this situation. In supporting our land exchange once more, you will not only help us find peace in this matter, but you will be supporting a resolution that will benefit the surrounding public by helping to mitigate flooding in the area. Thank you again for your time and for continued service to the people of Guam. Sincerely, Pat and Emma Collado. Thank you very much, Mrs. Collado. Uh, before I go further, I want to also recognize the presence of the Vice Speaker, Theresa Lahi, and Senator uh, Talina Nelson. Uh, before I open up to the panel for questions, I, Mr. Borja, um, I just want, I have several questions which hopefully will uh, clarify certain things on the bill. One is the um, the proposed uh, area for exchange in Dedido. Uh, you indicated it was Chamorro Land Trust property in your testimony. Well, yes, it is, but it's reserved for also transferring over for any kind of land transfers that may be approved by the Guam Legislature. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. So. My, my understanding I mean, was that it was set aside by Public Law 22-18 as an area, I think it was 70 acres, to be used for land exchanges, but was kept out, but is not a part of the Chamorro Land Trust inventory. Uh, I'll get back to you on that. Okay, right, thanks. Um, second question that I have is, with the Barrigada lot, and I've driven, uh, quite honestly, I, I looked at the map, and <laughs> I'm not good with maps, but for everybody's uh, orientation here. If you're driving uh, on Route 8 towards Barrigada Village, as you pass the, um, as you pass the Londro mat there, um, there's this big uh, hole uh, along Route 8 that was used, I guess, after one of the big typhoons to basically, that's where they were dumping a lot of the green waste. Well, the area that belongs to the Colados is back in that area there. Uh, but my question basically is that, um, as indicated by Mrs. Colado's um, testimony, is that the Corps of Engineers and the Guam EPA had pretty much determined that that lot, um, because of basically the development that has taken place, has now become a uh, wetland, and short of saying it's condemned, uh, basically, really, um, would prohibit uh, any kind of development on it. Um, in fact, if they wanted to turn that into a uh, profit-making uh, uh, waste site for green waste that is being used in an adjacent area, they probably couldn't do that either. Uh, so, would you agree that if in fact, and, and I, I'm not sure if we have the documentation for the Corps of Engineer findings, I, I think there is, but w would you agree that maybe that determination was a roundabout way of condemning that property, which then prohibits the Colados from being able to build on it? Well, that property along with the property right next to it the property known on the survey map as 6-R13, that's even a worse situation. There's actually a pond sitting right in that uh, as of uh, Monday. So the issue here is that many other properties around this island also are wetlands and unusable by the private property owners. Um, 
my family has a, a good part of a wetland area that's unusable, and so we, we completely <coughs> reserved it out in the subdivision, the parental subdivision of that lot to do, to keep it separate and not to be assigned to any anybody for future use. Um, I believe that this is the same thing. This is a lower area. There's a hill right next to it. So it was a natural area for the water to go. There's no doubt about it. And the fact, in, and even in these photographs, if you look closely, it, it is recognizable that people were backfilling. In one of the photos, there's a picnic table and chairs out there. I don't know if they're fishing or listening to the frogs at night, but you know, it's, it's obviously unusable. But my point here is that so are many other properties. If today we did this one, what about the guy whose property is on the side of a hill that's unusable? You know, because the family distribution in a probate gave him that, that piece of property. Now he wants something that he can use better. I mean, you know, could this be used for farming? I don't know. But the point is, is that um, it exists as a natural, because it's naturally a wetland area. It's a lower depressed area of it than, than its surrounding other lands. And, and that's the position that we're, we're at. And that this bill only recognizes one of those lots, when in fact the, the neighboring lot across from it is a worse situation, but nobody's coming forward to talk to that, to c compensate for that person today. Because if you were gonna use this as a ponding basin, you would have to do the whole thing, not just one half, one, a quarter acre on one side of the easement, but a quarter acre on the other side of the easement. So that's the problem that this, that this bill has today, is that there would probably be another one that you would have to do as well. Okay. Um, so I just got two, two final questions. Um, on this Barrigada lot that we're talking about, putting aside the wetlands um, issue and whatnot, I believe it's, uh, the size of it is point, a quarter of an acre, 0.28 acres. Now, putting aside for a moment the other constraints um, about the wetlands and all that stuff, would the landowner have been able to build a single family home on that quarter acre lot? Yes. It, it, could, it could have, okay. Well, and, yeah. and I guess where I'm going with this is the question is probably arising in the minds of my colleagues here as to why are, why would we want to exchange a quarter acre of land in Barrigada with a half acre of land in Dedido? And so are there any sort of constraints in that Dedido property? Well, the uh, constraint with the Dedido property is that, and the reason is we've, we've subdivided them out to half an acre is because it sits atop the northern aquifer and there are no existing sewer lines. And so you have to have as a minimum a, a quarter, a half acre lot to accommodate the Environmental Protection Agency requirements. So that's... So a minimum lot size in this uh, Dedido area that is used for land exchanges um, requires that, that a house lot be a minimum of a half acre then. And so that kind of puts into context why the bill proposes to exchange a quarter acre of land in Barragata with a half acre in, putting aside for a moment, right. all the other, you know, the so, wetland. So if this there. was, you know, just a basic piece all of property. All things being equal. All things being equal. What we've seen in the past with the land exchanges is you take either one or two different formulas into account, area for area or value for value. Correct. In this case, if you were looking at area for area, you give them, you allow them to have the other half acre, uh, quarter acre, but they have to purchase the other remaining quarter acre that makes up that half acre. Okay. All right. Senator. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, this, there, there's, you raised some interesting dilemmas, uh, uh, Mr. Bora. Um, and I'm just, uh, I guess I was hoping maybe on this, that somebody from perhaps DPW but would be here, but perhaps you could answer it. Uh, if a private property owner backfills his property so that he could make it more usable for himself and his family, 
Do you know, does that require a permit? Yes, it does. It does. It does require a government permit. Today, it does. Back in the 70s, you know, it was a different set of rules. And so when these properties were subdivided in the, in the 70s and then began to be used in the 70s and 80s and then probably early 90s, uh, I don't know what they were doing and what people were doing if they were going through a permitting process. There's a number of cases. The one next door to Wendy's, for example, in Barragata is a very good example of, of, of what was a depression, a natural depression uh, for water. And when the owner of that property filled it, it caused this considerable flooding to, to occur to the residents behind that lot on a very bad rainy day. Okay. Ms. Collado, you purchased this property when? In 1986, sir. And at that time, uh, were the properties around you developed? No. And when you did purchase the property, did you have an opportunity to go take a look at the property to see what you were yes, buying? Yes, sir, yeah. And at that time, were you aware that perhaps this was marshland? I mean, did it show any signs that this was marshland? Uh, no, it was a buildable land. It was basically a flat piece of property. Yes. And were the surrounding properties around you also flat? Uh, they're a little bit higher than me, but the the property that we build was a build was a good land. But see, the thing is, there was a land here. Okay. Uh, when we were when we were trying to. Uh, uh, we plan to build a house there because my brothers and sisters coming from the Philippines and instead of them going through a Section 8 or what, so we, we plan to build a house there so they can stay. And, and this, this lot adjacent to our lot was not, uh, was not backfilled yet. So when we were uh, applying for a permit, that's when the Guam EPA and uh, the Co Army Corps of Engineers visited the land. And what they saw was uh, the moorhen, the endangered species. That's, that was their first comment, that we cannot uh, uh, backfill, we cannot backfill, we cannot improve this land because there's an endangered species. And then after three years, we saw that this adjacent land had built already a house. You know, uh, they, they were allowed to backfill their land. So, meaning that the water that comes from this, this other properties goes all to our land now. That's when it became a wetland because there's no more, no more way to uh, the water. For the will, water to go. Yeah, to go. Because the water it, just the, naturally came yes, down on, on yes, your Yes, yes, because the, 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 this adjacent land was already higher than our land. Hmm. Um, okay. Uh, Mr. Borja, uh, you, say, you said that on this particular piece in Barragata that they would be able, I mean, without the wetland, or they would be able to build a single family home. Well, just based on the, the size of the lot. The that's, size of the that's lot. That's really all I'm looking at. Isn't, and correct me if I'm wrong, so the zoning of this particular piece, I would imagine, is agriculture. Right. Probably. Zone A. Isn't it a requirement that if an agricultural piece uh, was developed and the piece of property was under 2,000 square meters or under a half acre, that there would have to be the infrastructure in? I mean, and the reason why the, the half acre is because you have enough room to do a, a, a septic tank, cesspool septic tank type of a system. Is, and well, did, did I that currently apply to this property? I currently reside in a property in Barragata that is a quarter acre with a leaching field and a septic tank, and there is no sewer. On a, ha on a less yeah. than a half acre? Correct. 
it, it was developed that way. Okay. A few more questions, but I'm going to allow the other senator. Excuse to me, Senator. Yes. This land is an R1 land it in is Barigada. R1. Yes. Oh, okay. It's it's an R11 uh, land. So, in fact, we have we have it appraised at that time. We had it appraised. Okay. And if you're changing, if you're changing it, if you're exchange, uh, if you are exchanging it to an R1 to an agricultural land, the minimum that you can you can exchange it with to an agricultural land is a half acre, because there's no there's no sewer. Right. That's the minimum. Is there sewer in this Barriotta property? Yes, sir. Oh, there is. There is because it's an R1. There oh. is sewer. Okay, good enough, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I'm totally unfamiliar with this location, okay. uh, and so you're probably a lot more aware. How many houses really in that neighborhood or in that area, right okay. adjacent or nearby to this, this, this particular piece this of property? This lot, actually, if you were to look where Carbolito Elementary School, right across it, those people also flood during Pong Song Wa, we also assisted them and, and got them out through jet skis or boats. The Cepeda family, the Montanola in there, as well as uh, you have the Paredes. Uh, you have about maybe eight homes. And the home that she's talking about is the one at the dead end, the Montanola, were allowed to build. So if she wasn't allowed, then why was she allowed? It's a domino effect. Now. Every, there's other properties within that area, and now they want to build. So they are allowed to build, so Ms. Collado and her family, again, cannot, we're not allowed, and I won't allow her to build, because I am not going to get the emergency people to come out and rescue her during times of storm, because we have used jet skis in our area, and it's sad to say Barragata is nowhere within water. So I kindly ask, that we take a look at the other property as well, and I know Senator, we have talked about, actually I talked to Joe about this, about the adjacent property to this, that that will be sufficient to withhold those waters that are coming down within that area. It's very unfortunate, but that is the lowest area in that uh, the, Aspengo the, the, area the, where she's at. Her property, yes. the Colorado property, and this is last, the lowest. Yes, sir. Okay. And this last two weeks ago, when we had this flash flood, we had seven homes that flooded out, and one of the areas in your packet, I'm sorry it's not uh, colored, but that water, that home that was coming from the other side where the, the entrance to her, ho her, her road, and it's in two story, it's level, but that water passed that, the, the, the vehicle. So again, I feel that we should obtain this property so we can also assist the residents within the, uh, the areas so that we can contain these waters that we are allowing these residents to build. We're not trying to say no to the, any development, but we need to make sure we contain our waters. And this is why these developments that are happening today, and I'm really for sure that when you build one home, that make sure you contain your water with either garden rain or ga rain garden or some percolation trench around your area, Developers, they build one, wait three months, and they build another and another. There is no drainage system, and this is why Barragada is where it is today. We're not supposed to flood. We're supposed to be having adequate water flow, and there are sinkholes in our areas that are adequate, but not where you're allowing other people to develop and then sacrifice her property. And then now where is she going? I'm not going to allow this to her to build because it's not, she's going to, to flood as well, and, next, and that remaining property next to her. So, Senators, I only ask of you to consider, because Barragada shouldn't be a flood zone. Really, we shouldn't, not in the central part of the, the village. If I may, Mr. Chair, I might come back uh, to ask a few more questions, but I'll relinquish right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a few questions. Um, Mr. Bora, you mentioned that there are many lots on the island that are wetlands. Are they in the same predicament as Ms. Colada? 
or are they owners are the owners of the property original owners or are they property that was bought by some other folks and it just keeps on going down like you mentioned well speaking personally it's original landowners for the for the wetlands that we own okay so you know that property we severed out completely because we knew it was going to be unusable because it was it was shown we showed it on the survey map uh, that it was a wetland. This survey map doesn't show any of that. It doesn't have any topography or any features of the lands. Many of the current uh, um, maps that are drawn out when you do come across wetland areas, they depict those kinds of things now. But the, you know, there are many people out there. I don't know if some are bought. I mean, you have all kinds of issues with private develop development. People have bought lands from uh, um, <coughs> properties that were bought over and over and subdivided. That, that have these kinds of conditions um, throughout the island as well. I mean, more than, you know, not just ponding, but uh, easements that are uh, unimproved and requiring to be fixed because they, they're, they're running out from the heavy rains. But the government's not allowed to touch it because of the, the easement was never dedicated to the government. And so you have all these, you know, really terrible roads in many parts of the island. Um, leading to, you know, private residences, and there's just nothing the government could do. But yes, there are a number of people throughout the island that have these kinds of issues with, with unusable lands. I mean, just okay. the Ganya Springs, for example. You know, that's, that's definitely, uh, you know, you can't touch that area, but there are people that own those properties. All right. So, so w w would you say then that um, when the government's going to issue building permits, like public works, because it's quite obvious that when building permits are issued, I don't think anybody's talking to land management to say how the property is situated. And, and I don't know if you have the data that says how the water would flow if anybody develops. Because I see that where I live in Chigo, in La Chance. Perfect, everything looks good. When they started developing, all of a sudden, the home I, that looked great, all of a sudden now they have problems with flood. And the only thing that I, I've asked him, what happened, dude? And he goes, the house I next door, when they gave the permit, they built it, now it's flooding into my area. I said, so, so would you recommend then, or maybe say that public works needs to work with land management when they start issuing permits? And, you know, make well, sure that everybody understands. Well, part of the permitting process also has to go through EPA, and I think they're the ones that, that also look at those kinds of issues to determine whether or not there's, there's you know, wetland areas or there's there's flooding, potential flooding issues as well. And even Guam Water Works looks at that kind of so, stuff. So you're saying it's EPA. Not just It's not just us. I mean, there's a list of people that you have to go through for, for a building okay. permit, a number of regulatory agencies. And um, we're trying to get to a point where those kinds of, that kind of information is, is much better. Uh, I believe even at DPW to, to, to understand the topography, our, our geographical information systems are getting better and better where we can start seeing the geographies of lands and see where the hills are and, and, and depressions in the land are so we can determine if, if backfilling an area is going to cause problems to the surrounding neighbors. Okay. But in the cases of, you know, people building private homes, what you have here, if it's not a organized subdivision development, there's no requirement for installing the, the you know, the, the water drainage systems that that subdivision developments have where, you know, you have gutters that collect the water and move it forward to somewhere else uh, or to a ponding basin in that development. So when you get private landowners or people who buy like a quarter or a, a, buy up a couple acres of land and divide them up into quarter acres, put homes on them, they're not, in, they're not doing some of the things that a larger developer is made to do because the, the standards don't exist for those kinds of people. Um, and in many cases, it could be just they subdivided the land and everyone just built their homes and, and there's no, no accountability for anybody to, to determine how the water, where the, where the drainage water should go to. I know, and you know, again, personally, I live on a lower end, but fortunately, it still continues downward. And on a heavy, rainy day, my yard is a raging river. So I... I designed my backyard and the front area in a way so that it channels the water around the house and doesn't pond, you know, or come into the house. Fortunately, it moves fast enough that it never sits. But, 
you know, on a rainy day, well, there's a past heavy rain, you know, it came into the carport and you know, I was searching the neighborhood for my Zoris. But the, you know, I had to take action once I realized where I was at. It didn't look like that when I bought it, but of course, in the heavy August rains that we sometimes get, that's the kind of stuff that happens. Okay. Uh, the, the, the next one I have is when you mention here on your letter that um, the exchange of property, the quarter acre lot, it's a residential versus a half acre agricultural on a residential lot, isn't the isn't the shoreline available normally? Not necessarily. I mean, I don't know for a fact that a sewer line is there just because it's zoned R1 doesn't mean it has a sewer line. We require that anyone that's going to get a, a, uh, a zoning R2 and greater has to have a sewer. So I'm on a residential R1. I don't have a sewer. So it's not necessarily true that just because you're in a residential lot that you have a sewer line. Uh, but I do not know the specifics in this case. I can see from the overheads that you know, it's an unimproved road. I don't know if there's a sewer line in there. It doesn't seem to be a, a road that, that sticks, that's stuck straight on the designed easement area. Okay. So I don't know what it has. So, in that so, so maybe the mayor can answer that. Is In that area, do they have access to sewer? Not where um, they're at. They are okay. in an Arwen. Um, the okay. school, however, is connected to sewer from the other side. So. Um, on the village proper, they're on the Espengo side. No, yeah, the, mayor, the, only reason, the only reason why I'm, tr I'm asking that question was to kind of like put value to that part you mentioned, exchange value for value. If it's a quarter acre lot, it should be a quarter acre lot. Well, that's area for area, but you know, in value for value, we look at what the appraised value of this property would be and then exchange it for something that is equal. And in this case, if we're going to go up there and we say, well, let's just say it's the same price, we, okay. the same price per square meter, and they qualify for a quarter acre worth of land, they can be allowed, if you allow, if you authorize it, to purchase the other quarter acre to make up the half acre, but not, or, or else find someplace else that would be available for them um, that's at a quarter acre size. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Vice Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for your testimony, Mayor and, and Mr. Borja, Ms. Collado. Um, I was, I appreciate your re, uh, reminding us of the history of this, this um, your attempts at getting um, an exchange. Um, does, do we know the value of any of this property? The Dedido lot or the Barragata lot? I know that I was just in a site that shows that information. I can probably pull it up it's here. It's available, you think? It's available. All right. Um, okay, we can get it later then. I just want to know if it's available. And uh, I was reading that you mentioned that the bill was vetoed, so the mayor had included the governor's veto. And uh, he's, he seems to also agree that um, this one lot is not enough for a ponding basin, and it would require the lot, I guess, across the street, as you described, and, and Senator described. But um, um, has any effort been made to resolve obtaining that? Because even if we did this exchange and, and did as you described, Mayor, then you wouldn't be able, it looks like, to use it as ponding basin unless you also get that. Are, is there any, are there any plans for that? Uh, good morning, Senator. Yes, I did mention um, the neighboring property also should be obtained, and that's the one uh, Mr. Mark Bora was talking about. It's even worse. And um, that was, it's owned by Ms. Betty Jean Torres, if I, be, I believe. And I, I did um, encourage her also to see Senator Tomada about that. And okay, uh, there's, there's been no history of bills or anything regarding no, that not, property? No, not her property. Okay. She attempted to build, she wanted to sell. But, you know, unfortunately she has, and she did come to my office, but I told her that, you know, if you want to sell, I, I probably would tell her not to, I, or I'm going to, I'm going to really need to, I really need to obtain it for a ponding piece, uh, ponding purpose. The, um, the governor's veto message also 
referenced the, the, the Derido lot, the problem with the Derido lot, although I think this is the lot that's been designated for land exchanges, that it, it has Derido Ariendo permittees. Is that still an issue? Yes, there are some. And so, do you know in particular with this lot that's designated in this bill, if there's an issue, um, I guess he was concerned about having to kick somebody out of their lot up there. Oh, no, no, we, we would not be trying to kick anyone out. Um, there, there are others that have already been acquiring. There are some that we're holding for others that are longstanding um, uh, approved transferees, but they haven't, they haven't finalized the, the deed work. So um, those, those are the ones we're working for. The most recent uh, individual that we allotted a lot uh, land over there was for land taking in the, the Department of Corrections buffer zone. And, uh, and in that case, I think because it came out to a certain size, we, we had to subdivide out some land just to make it to the proper size and get it of, of what they were going to get for in the Valley of the Valley. So is it fair to say then that the, the veto message, is, uh, the concern stated in that veto message regarding uh, that the government land is occupied by numerous permittees of the Arendo program and squatters, uh, not advantageous to the potential recipients since relocation of existing residents would be difficult and time consuming, that that's no longer an issue. That's well, not an issue today for us. Right, we had there. to take a, those those people that were there under Arendo programs and, and convert them over to Chamorro Land Trust leases. Um, as far as squatters that are um, not eligible for either, for any of the programs or we're in no program, they're a different story that, you know, we have to deal with separately. Does the Department of Land Management have a process to to establish ponding basins? When we did our subdivision master plans, we created those kinds of, uh, we, we set aside areas just for that purpose and areas where we believed it needed it. But I mean, we've had to follow the prescribed master plan development um, <laughs> processes when we created those subdivision master plans. So yes, we, we do have those in areas where we even had to create areas for, for um, community uh, purposes like parks and playground areas. And, and Mayor, finally, do you know if, if the, I see a lot of um, correspondence in here talking about endangered species. That's one of the reasons she was not given a permit. Um, it's because they want her to go through a different application because we've got endangered species there. Uh, so do you think you would be able to establish a ponding basin? Do we know? Y yes, I we mean, can. Have you pursued that? Yeah, if we clean it, you know, the neighbors around it, they are aware of that property. No, I mean by law. Would oh. they allow you to establish a ponding basin or to change, um, you know, um, I don't know. I don't know what it takes to establish a ponding basin if that would be allowed knowing the, what we know about this property, that it's a wetland that they've got an endangered species on it, and I don't even know if that's still the case. I don't think there's an endangered species. That was back in 1990, and how I met her, I was only actually an administrative assistant, and at one time she wanted to build also a, a daycare, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, that's how I really got to know her, and it was really great that she was trying to do so, but then unfortunately these things happen, and, and um, now that you're saying if, if it's we, if we are able to, I, I should, I mean, I feel and I ask that we should put something into law, that we should have a ponding basin there. Uh, there's a lot of developments going on in Barragada. Uh, properties are now, you know, given back to the um, third generations and they want to build. So again, the lowest level is her property uh, on that area. So I feel that, you know, having that ponding basin will be sufficient to, to contain those waters around those other neighbors that already built their homes. I can see how the ponding basin would be useful, so that I don't have an issue with that. It's, it's whether, I guess, the Army Corps would allow you or anyone, EPA, would allow you to actually create a ponding basin. If we're really going to get to that solution with this bill or we're not, I guess I want to know, do you know, Mr. Borja, sure. if yes, that would Senator. be prohibited or allowed? No, I'm sorry, I do not know I don't, the laws I, I for don't that. Know. Sorry, uh, sorry, all right, Senator. well, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. Thank you, Madam uh, Vice Speaker. Uh, Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
got ahead a bunch of questions, but th they were asked. I just wanted to know how did how did you discern that you were going to look for the Dedido property as a replacement or an exchange for the Barragata property? How did you discern that it was that specific lot, that specific area, that village? No, 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 no lot has been decided upon, but there is existing public law that has already set aside that an area in Dedido for the purpose of future land transfers that may occur, such as this request. So this request is not going to look for the land transfer in Dedido, the, ag the agriculture area that you were talking about? I'm sorry, this... There's a public law 22-18 set aside 70 acres uh, in Dedido over there in the vicinity of the Maria Ojoa School. Okay. And so that 70 acres uh, has been set aside for land exchanges, which portion of that would be used for a land exchange in this case that hasn't been determined yet. Uh, okay. So there's no guarantee in this bill that this would offer the land exchange in Dedido for at the request of the Oh no, once this bill it, this bill is enacted into law, then we would then begin working with the okay. with the private landowner to find a suitable property for them over there. Yes, because uh, it's on an R1 and there's infrastructure in the place. I'm wondering that if you're going to exchange a property to to help the person, to help the people, that you would also ensure that they had the same infrastructure or um, amenities available to them. So you would want to make sure that they have power and water also. <laughs> Otherwise, if you just give them a land and then they have to uh, pay for a, a septic tank and then they have to pay to run power there. I think that that would also hurt them more than help them. So I, I just hope that you consider those things when you, if this is really going to happen. And then um, uh, the concern also is that I think that uh, we need to solidify to ensure, Mayor, that uh, the interests of the people of Barragada are protected in reference to the ponding basin because as the vice speaker pointed out, I don't really think that that solidifies that to make you uh, authorized to build a ponding basin. For all we know, we can give it to someone else and then someone else builds something on top of it and then you have a huger, pro you know, a larger problem addressing the flood areas in your village. So um, that's all, but I hope that we can find ways to, Mr. Chair, to make it so that their interests are protected. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of points I would like to make. Uh, first of all, this particular R1 quarter acre lot, whether regardless of whether there's sewer lines, sewer infrastructure in the area, the land that lot owner could build a single family home on that quarter acre lot, um, but will be required to put in a septic tank. Am I, am I correct? Correct. Right. Now the land up in Dedido, because it sits over the aquifer, by law requires that minimum lot size is a half acre. Correct. To be able to build on it. Now, uh, Mrs. Collado, um, uh, Mr. Borja suggested that if we're gonna take that quarter acre lot in, um, uh, in Dedido and, and putting aside and just exchange it area for area, uh, but because there's that requirement in Dedido that you need to have a half acre, um, would you be amenable or receptive to the idea that you would have to buy the other quarter acre as opposed to giving you property that's twice the size? Okay, just, uh, uh, just you don't have to answer that right now, but that was a suggestion that was made uh, for those who may have a question in their mind as to why are we exchanging uh, a quarter acre lot for a half acre lot. Uh, and so that was the suggestion that was made. Think about it. You don't need to, to, to answer it right now. And uh, it'll be at least another week before we report this out. Uh, okay. Uh, if we have the value of that agricultural land in Dedido, how much would that be, the value? Right, and, and, and those, those details have to be worked out. The, the, the principle here is that he's suggesting that maybe the other quarter acre lot be purchased at whatever that value 
So that quarter acre lot is? Uh, yeah, because I in the 80s when I bought that property, sir, when we bought that property in the 80s, that Barigada lot, the value was 60000 And considering the market now, that could be an 80000 value. So how much is the value of that agricultural land that you're giving me? So if I have to buy a quart, that quart, since you're giving us a half acre, and the value of that agricultural land is only 25, 30, then is the government is still winning again? winning against us because our lot now, if you consider the market, is about 80,000. Why would we still have to pay the quarter acre for that agricultural land? Okay, I'm not gonna debate that, um, but I'm, I'm just bringing up the point that the yes, director sir. had made and for you to think about it. Yeah. And um, we'll close the loop on that later. Okay. If there's no, Senator. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, um, I've been writing things down. Uh, the and the chairman did ask the question that I wanted to ask about your willingness to perhaps consider purchasing that other quarter acre if you were to be given a full half acre, and I understand your concerns, uh, I, I really do, uh, but one of the considerations that probably needs to be had uh, to answer your question is because even though you may have purchased the property, and I'm not trying to antagonize you, but just more of a realistic approach, is because you may have purchased the property at $60,000, but at the same time, over the years, because of all the development around you, it has turned into a wetland. The value of $60,000 may no longer be there. And that's the inequity to you. I mean, that's, that's the harm that you suffer, that the value of your property is no, might no longer be at that level that you bought it at because now it may be deemed unusable to be built on. Uh, and that's, I, and I'm just saying, and I, but I understand, I'm not trying to enter into debate here, I'm just saying that's one of the thoughts that came into my head. Um, the other issue that the director from land management brought up is their concern of having to pay uh, for the cost of the survey and the mapping and the registration of the land up in Dedido that would need to be exchanged. Mr. Director, do you know approximately what that cost would be? You can usually look at about $1,000 for a half acre to just survey. About $1,000. Land registration is already done. We wouldn't be doing it on unregistered land. Um, but just the, the surveying of the property is roughly around $1,000 a half acre. Okay. And I just wanted to add that on to a consideration for you as well, Mrs. Collado, in that the question would be, and you don't have to answer today, would you be willing to, at the very least, half that cost with Department of Land Management? Uh, yes, sir. But let me go back. If I may, can I, can I also voice out my my answer to your first question uh, of course that the value of my property now is no longer the 60,000 because it's now a wetland right but in the first place the wetland situation was because the government of Guam made my property to become a wetland because they they approved the surrounding properties to backfill their land. So it was not my fault. Right. It was not our fault. Right. So if you, in, if you were saying that 
the, the, the value of my land now is no longer 60,000. Yes, I agree with you, Sen Mr. Senator. I agree with you completely. But it was not my fault that my land became a wetland. That's true. That's true. And, and, so we have to consider that also when you were saying when uh, Department of Land Management director is saying that am I willing to buy that, uh, that quarter acre for the agricultural land? Let me think of that because if you think, if you will see the situation, the situation was caused by the government of Guam. I understand. That my property became a wetland. I understand, and that's why it was an important question to me earlier when I asked the director whether if anybody backfills, whether they need to get permitting. Because if they needed to get permitting from the government and the government allowed it, you are probably correct that it, because they allowed for the permitting, it was that that caused your land to become lower than the surrounding properties around you. And, and, I, and yes, I definitely sir. appreciate what you just said. Mr. Director, probably just one last question, Mr. Mr. Chair. The, you said also earlier that in your own lot up in Barragata, that when it does rain, especially heavy, right, that your lot definitely also potentially floods. But to mitigate that, you designed it so that the water does not actually runs off your property so that your own lawn doesn't flood. Is that kind of a it correct representation? It circumnavigates around my house. I it, keep the water within my lot. I don't press, pass it on to the neighbor, but it, it goes to a, a, um, a common ditch that the, uh, the developer put in place. Okay, so there is no, I mean, by having it circum, by designing your, your, your landscape, where it is, the water no longer or doesn't flow onto your lot. It kind of circumnavigates and then it goes into a ditch. It's not necessarily a ponding basin, but it's a ditch in which the water then gets to flow into and and percolate or, or run off somewhere else. Is that is that a fair statement? Correct. Okay. But that would almost seem to be that's what happened here. That the surrounding area around her was allowed, was allowed to develop their properties and it was allowed, the water was allowed to then circumnavigate their properties uh, of, of, of Ms. Collado's lot and it goes now into the Collado's lot. The only difference is it's not a public ditch, it's private property. Uh, I mean, I think that's kind of like the analogy I have in my head, and so yours may not harm private property by the way you designed your, your lot, right? But in in Ms. Collado's case, because the government was perhaps may have had, I'm mean, just say may have had some culpability in allowing the backfilling to happen, it may have denigrated the Collado lot. But I do understand your concern, uh, Mr. Mr. Director, uh, this could potentially open a floodgate of other requests. And since we only have really 70 acres that are reserved up in Dededo, uh, we, again, may run into a dilemma. Uh, 70 acres only translates into 140 half-acre lots. And if you take away the easements, I think the calculation is perhaps 70% uh, would be usable and then 30 percent would be allowed for infrastructure development whether the roads and, and whatnot is that kind of a correct uh, no, no they're roughly uh, a half acre the easements are already there it's been oh, the subdivided easements already there right okay and do you know how many lots are left because I know over time there have been exchanges uh, with private property owners uh, and so out of all the lots that are up in that reserved piece of property. Do you know how many are left? I'll find that answer out, but like I said, we are already holding um, a considerable amount for another family that was supposed to, well, that they were approved for a land transfer in 1998. They just have never been willing to accept the deal. So um, we are holding the land for them uh, in the event they finally decide to do something. Uh, on that particular case, just out of curiosity, 
Are we holding more than a half acre? Correct. We're holding probably, um, probably about eight acres. Eight acres? Eight. Eight out of the 70. Correct. You're saying there's 70 acres up there, Correct. in essence. Wow. We, we, they are obligated, well, according to our calculations, they are um, allowed to have half a million dollars in appraised value of the land transfer. Oh, so it's a value for value. It was a value for value. Wow. And under those circumstances, real briefly, and again, because I'm trying to see if it relates, what was the situation there? Was, the, was their land needed for government purposes? Yes, their land was, it, it, it's a really dated issue. Goes all the way back to the, the, the mid 60s, their land was taken for Gura housing. Oh, there was a taking. They were taking. compensated, but they refused to receive it. So they uh, came to the legislature in 1998. Legislation okay. was enacted into law allowing for a, a transfer of property. And we have never, to this okay. day, despite numerous attempts to work with them, been able to conclude that. So we're holding the property because it still sits, it's, it's, it's still viable for them. Okay. Um, unfortunately, they're all very, very old right. folks now and, and several okay. have just passed away recently. All right, I, I appreciate that. Um, this is a, not an easy decision. I mean, as much as we would hope it would be an easy decision, because we understand the harm to you and your inability to use your private property, but also when you consider the, the, the challenges that the Department of Land Management has in, in holding those lots and the potential floodgate that could open uh, <laughs> should we go down this road, uh, it's one of those things, I, it's a very serious consideration. Uh, and we're, you know, of course, we always try to look favorably uh, and try to resolve this as favorably as we can, but it's not an easy decision. Madam, Spe uh, Madam Mayor, it looks like you want something to say, and I'll, I'll ask you to say it. Yes, thank you. You know, with um, all said, I feel that there's supposed a law should be in place that any one building should retain their water, put a rain garden within your air, find ways to contain them. Because, like I said, those that have built, and Maria that built way back in the 60s and 70s are now experiencing that flood or that water now going into their homes. And I hate to see that where they are not able to build or, or, or do anything because they're the lowest level. Now maybe if there is some kind of legislation that can allow or, or have these people that are now building to put something in place that they must retain their water most especially those with development. They wait, they buy this big parcel, and I can tell you a lot in Barragada. They allow them, I'll build one today, and then um, three months later, build again, and they're not putting any drainage system. Okay, I, that, that's, that's an excellent recommendation. It kind of goes beyond the bill, and even if a bill is enacted tomorrow, it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't address uh, the Colado issue. Yes, uh -huh. and so, I understand, uh, but because of this, this, this is where we're at today. Sure. And we just need to resolve them. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no more questions. Okay. Vice Speaker. Yes, I just want, um, Mr. Borja, in your testimony, you said the flooding is caused by natural conditions, and we've heard testimony otherwise. So I would like you, if you could, before we hear this bill in, on, in the session, to confirm or sub submit again in writing if you can confirm whether this adjacent properties were backfilled, as alleged, and when, and whether it was done by permit, please. And, and I guess just reconsider whether this was natural flooding always in this area, or it's been caused by development. Thank you. Thank you very much. There being no further questions, we'll consider Bill 171 uh, as having been duly heard. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Senators. We'll move on to Bill 172-34. I would ask if we can just take a, well, no. We're going to go ahead and proceed. 
Um, so I'll go ahead and introduce it here. Bill 172-34 is an act to authorize the expenditure of $34,312 from the Chamorro Land Trust Survey and Infrastructure Fund to pay for leasehold improvements on Chamorro Land Trust leased lot block lot 11 block 2 track 10314 municipality of Dedido that is being voluntarily surrendered by the CLTC lessee providing testimony is Mr. Michael Borja Mr. Borja please proceed again good morning senators uh, my name is Michael Borja from the Department of Land Management in Bill Number 172-34, it intends to compensate a Chamorro Land Trust lessee who has who is voluntarily surrendering her lease for a lease, uh, her lease uh, for the leasehold improvements. Uh, since the initial request by the lessee to surrender to the Chamorro Land Trust lease, COTC and the Department of Land Management have conducted all necessary steps outlined in the Guam Code annotated to obtain the necessary appraisals. In December of 2016, legislation similar to this bill was introduced to authorize the payment of, of the net fair market value of the leasehold improvements. However, the bill expired sine die. At the start of the legislative term, we again sought the introduction of a bill, but, needed, but heeded the recommendation to seek uh, an interested applicant to lease the property and purchase the leasehold improvements. After su many successive attempts, of vetting with Guam Housing Corporation to identify applicants financially qualified to purchase the home, we could not identify any candidates. However, CLTC identified a lessee who needed to be relocated from their current site because the half acre lot was improperly leased to two different lessees and the land was not formally under the CLTC jurisdiction until a recently enacted uh, public law. One of the lessees will remain on that particular lot to finally enjoy the execution of the home loan to construct their permanent house. The other lessee will need to be relocated to this bill's subject lot once it's enacted into law. Moving this lessee to the surrendered le leasehold will cost less than having to replace her current home to another site, which would also include the expense of, for the installation of utilities. This bill is not seeking to authorize actions not permitted in the law, but merely to authorize the expenditure of funds to complete the, the lessee's desire to surrender her CLTC lease. The lessee whom this bill will compensate for the leasehold improvements being surrendered is elderly and has been working with the CLTC for almost two years to bring a resolution to this matter. I humbly ask for your kind consideration to favorably report this bill out of committee and to pass it in the next session. Um, this this lessee, uh, you know, she she was widowed, and the home, the concrete home which she had built, uh, they wanted to she wanted to just leave and go relocate to uh, to live with a daughter, and didn't want to pass this this lease on to anybody else. She just wanted to surrender it in in, in total. The law does require us that in, the, in these cases, and we could see these things potentially moving forward. You know, these are 99-year leases, so this is, while they might be exceptions, they can occur. It'll, it requires the Chamorro Land Trust Commission to get three appraisals, get the fair market value, determine if there's any outstanding costs. Um, she's actually been paying her property taxes regularly and still and is current, but you get that net, you get that fair market value, you subtract out costs to include the cost of the appraisals, and then that's what the value of the leasehold improvement is. In this case, it's $34,000. Um, and it's, because it's, a, it is a very small concrete home, uh, concrete roof and everything. So we're looking to move, you know, just finalize this whole lease termination, a voluntary lease termination, and then it turned out we had to relocate somebody else from another lot elsewhere. And, and again, the law requires that we have to move somebody because of a mistake that was made in some way on our part, we have to foot the cost of, of replacing their home. The cost of finding a replacement for her home was 
going to be more expensive than just putting her into this house. And she's agreed to move into this house once all this is done. And it's, and it's kind of a, there's, there's, there's a whole bunch of elements that ended up getting into play in this thing because that lot that she got doubled up on, again, wasn't originally CLTC. Only recent legislation got it put back into CLTC. And the other individual in that lot got a VA loan but the VA couldn't execute the loan until the property was completely under the control of CLTC and this other lessee was vacated. So there's a number, it sounds like a soap opera, I hope I didn't confuse you all, but going back to the basic cause of this bill, we're just trying to compensate a lessee, an elderly woman who, who wants to just finally retire away. I mean, she is quite elderly and, and then just close it off and then begin to use it for other purposes that the CLTC needs. Like I said, we did attempt to find people that would qualify for purchasing this home in, in many cases, well in all the cases, either they didn't qualify or they didn't want a one bedroom, uh, 400 square meter concrete house or square foot house. So it's, you know, it's, and it's not in a bad location, it's right on Botello Road near the golf course. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, just for clarification, I guess by the passage of this bill, by allowing CLTC to buy out the lease improvements that was made on this is called the Garrido lot, um, it really puts into place a couple of other CLTC uh, leaseholders. But the buying out this um, this uh, leasehold improvement uh, that uh, uh, from the person that's voluntarily surrendering is really more for a uh, humanitarian reason. The individual is elderly, a family member wants to take her off island where she can get better medical care and take care of her and all that. That's, that's correct too. Okay. So that's the humanitarian aspect of this particular bill. By moving out of that leaseholder from this particular lot 11 allows then the Chamorro Land Trust to move another lessee into that property uh, to be able to then vacate another uh, Chamorro Land Trust property. And then that makes then a third leaseholder whole uh, so that they have the lot size that is required to be able to build a lot <coughs> on it. So, it's uh, like you said, it, it can get very easily confusing, uh, but all the parties are in agreement and the passage of this one bill kind of just start, uh, puts everything in place and does right for three uh, CLTC uh, lessees. I probably confused it more than, <laughs> but, but that's where it is. Uh, does anybody have any questions, Senator, Vice Speaker? I, the part I don't understand is, I mean, I, I understand the bill. It's a one person built a house. We want to now compensate them because they're giving their property back. Okay, so the value of the house, right? However, I don't understand this other parts, and I'm wondering if you're trying to move that other, the second person over to this lot, why, why? Are they not paying for the house because Be we took their house? Isn't that a taking? I mean, are you saying that Correct, by public law 34-14, we took their house, that it wasn't Jamar Lantra's land, but they built a house on it? Whose land was it? It was under the administrative control of the GECO mayor. So they're going to, we're going to give her this house for free pretty much? Well, not really, because it, we had to take her pla her house and we but had to replace her somewhere else. We would have to be looking for money to do that later on to find a new well, place. Well, not or build necessarily, her new because these two people on that first lot, the Jigo Mayor's lot, were not Chamorro Land Trust lessees. They were. On the Jigo Mayor's lot? Correct. That's the problem that we were trying to correct. Okay. It was done a long All time right. ago. They were okay, put then there, that makes so sense. we're just trying if to sort that problem. If they believe they were less, if you they believe were they were lessees, but yes. we didn't. 
technically own that property. That's what you, that's, okay. So, so you give this to her, you give this house to her, uh, and the deal's done? <laughs> It's, uh, you don't owe her any more money for no. her house? No, and, and when we, we did the due diligence to find out, she just wanted a container home. That's what she was in already. It wasn't even feasible to move that container because it was already too, uh, too broken up. So just to get a container home, pay the utility fees and the, the costs that come with hooking up new utilities, we were gonna far exceed this 34, we, in fact, we stopped at $34,000. We didn't even take into consideration the thousands or more we'd have to pay in the utility fees. Could, could we ask that you get that in writing then and we do it con together so that we don't come back later with another issue that we have to pay out cash for, that's what I'm hoping. You know, or, or at least at least you get it on the Tomorrowland. I, that's my other question oh, with this yeah. bill is, this, uh, you are supposed to pay them out, but what, what other funds would there be if not this fund to well, do this? The, it would come out of the Tomorrow Land Trust Operations Fund, which there were some monies in there, but that's, in this case, the, the infrastructure fund was selected, but the uh, operations fund has has funds in it available as well. All right, and is there a, a resolution by the Land Trust Commission regarding this bill? Um, I think there was a motion, I'll find that, but I think it was not a resolution, it was by a, a motion at a board meeting that we had to take this action. But are you talking about but, recent? But no, for I, I think Carino, we do have a copy of the minutes yes. where okay. this issue was brought up and the, uh, and the um, commission uh, agreed uh, to know, this purchase. I mean, uh, recently, right? You're not talking about like back o in October of last year. Okay, all right then. Yeah. That's good. All right, if I could, yeah, we could just keep put that together with this packet. That sounds good. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks, uh, Senator Castro. Do you have any questions? Okay. All right. There are no further questions on oh, Senator San Augustine. Do you have any questions? Okay. No further questions on 172. Uh, we'll consider 172 as having been um, duly heard. And now to our final bill. Uh, Bill 161-34 introduced by Senator Joseph Augustine, which is an act to transfer lot 5173, uh, new-R-2-R2, known as the Tamuni <laughs> Multipurpose Field. For everyone, that's the property, the baseball field in Tamuni that's bounded by the Tamuni Elementary School and the LBJ Elementary School, and uh, in the front, there's that blue <coughs> store. Um, uh, and we're going to exchange, we're going to basically, that's part of the Chamorro Land Trust inventory and to transfer that lot uh, to the jurisdiction and responsibility of the Timuning Mayor's Office. Uh, Senator, did you want to have anything more to say on that? No, no. no thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I just look forward to that, hoping my colleagues will support this so that Timuning may, may soon have their own uh, sports complex in Timuni, <laughs> like Dendu has and what Tum uh, Talapo was pursuing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Uh, signing up to provide testimony is uh, Mr. Mike Borja. Uh, Senator um, Mayor Rivera, you only put here checked off in favor. Are you going to provide oral testimony? Please step forward. Please step forward. And also Mr. Javier Atalik. Um, so, I, if I may, I would like to defer to the mayor first. Um. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am here in support of this bill and to answer any questions that you may have. We did send a resolution from our Municipal Planning Council um, asking that it be reverted back to our inventory. All right, thank you, and uh, we'll, we'll save the questions until after everybody has had a chance to provide their testimony. Uh, Mr. Borja. Again, good morning, Senators. Um, this bill has a, or this land has a lot of history, just like the last bill we talked about. On Bill 161-34, it intends to administratively transfer property in Tamuning to the mayor of the municipality of Tamuning. This bill would authorize a portion of Lot 5173, New 3, be transferred and to transfer in whole 5173, New 2, R2, 
the background of both these lots must first be explained. On the lot uh, new three in the municipality of Tamuning, number one, this lot is defined by a survey map 165 FY80 with an area of approximately 17,711 square meters or 4.38 acres. I included exhibit uh, the map of that. And it's uh, of government land used for school. In February of 1994, pursuant to uh, to the 21 GCA section 75104, the governor administratively transferred an inventory of government lands to the Chamorro Land Trust Commission, and it's recorded as instrument number 503740. This transfer gave 1.3 acres of this lot to the CLTC while retaining three acres for the Department of Education, which is currently being used for the Lyndon B. Johnson Elementary School. Of the 1.3 acres assigned to CLTC, today, Tamuning Elementary School occupies 1.21 acres, or approximately 4,878 square meters. The remaining section of land that is not used by the school contains a structure known as the Blue Tamuning Mart, consisting of 0.17 acres, or 707 square meters. Bill 161 should be corrected to include these two parts. Number, number one, grant administrative transfer of 707 square meter portion of lot 5173, new three, uh, as shown on survey map 165 FY80, from the Chamorro Land Trust Commission to the mayor of the municipality of Tamuning. And on two, grant administrative transfer of the 4,878 square meter portion of lot 5173, new three, uh, as shown again on the survey maps 165 FY80 from the Tremor Land Trust Commission to the Department of Education. On lot 5173 new 2R2 in the municipality of Tamuning, this lot is, de is defined by a survey map 26589 and it was originally described as lot 5173 new 2R1 with an area of approximately 25,615 square meters or 6.33 acres. The Department of Land Management changed the lot name to Lot 5173, New 2R2, in its proposed lot scheme, uh, M19S002. Public Law 13159 transferred this land to the Department of Parks and Recreation. Then Public Law 18-15 gave the control back to the village commissioner. But in February 1994, again, the governor administratively transferred all that land back to the Chamorro Land Trust Commission, um, and, but they only gave 6.27 acres of it, so almost all of it. So this property, but this property is currently used by the mayor of the municipality of Tamuni for community recreational facilities as it was originally intended. If the intention of this legislation is to assign administrative jurisdiction of these two properties, the Department of Land Management recommends incorporating the changes mentioned above uh, to, so the lands are appropriately assigned to their existing public users. Okay, okay, thank you. Mr. Talik. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Javier M. Talik, Jr. And uh, with regards to this bill here that we're talking about, with regards to this Timoning land, changing it to the, the ownership of DOE and Chamorro Land Trust and giving it to the Timoning Mayor's Office, sponsored by uh, Senator Joseph and Augustine. I mean, you know, folks, I just want to get straight to the point with you guys. I grew up in Timoning. I was born at a GMH. I went to LBJ, I went to Timoning Elementary, I go to church at St. Anthony, I graduated at JFK. So my life is about Timoning. I'm, I've been on the MPC for Timoning with the last mayor and the current mayor. So I think pretty much they like me as a Timoning uh, person, okay? So when I'm looking at you guys, I'm trying to think, which senator here is here I have ties to Timoning? Well, I look at Senator Jimmy Espadon, his wife's from Timoning. I look at Senator uh, Ada. Francis Israel was my fourth grade teacher, and uh, Situn Pedro was a very good donator to the baseball little league 
when, we were, when I was a kid growing up, I seen about five different mayors growing up in Timunin. You know, that's my whole life is about Timunin. So, you know, when, when, when you, you, you look at the, the, the mayor's office in Timunin, okay, we have a, a gym, we have a senior citizen thing, we have a tennis court and a basketball court out there. But look how many people come from different villages to utilize our gym, to utilize our basketball thing. Where, where is the thing for Timunin? Nothing. So in this piece of property right here that we're talking about, when I was growing up, I'm a pure baseball fan, okay? When I go to Santa Rita, I go to Sa Sinohanya, I go to Derido, Jigo, I go to the village and I can sit down there in the middle of the village and say, wow, man, I wish Timunin had this. But we don't have that. And Timunin is running out of property because when people want to go jogging, in the middle of the morning, they come over and they block the morning road. But we don't complain, we welcome everybody. But what I would really like is to have this piece of property established because for the last five mayors that I've known growing up in the morning, those mayors are the only ones who took care of that property. I didn't see DOE, I didn't see Tomorrow Land Trust come over and do this, but somehow, for some reason, the legislature always has an, an issue when they want property, prime property. Let's face it, man, everything's in the money. From malls to hospitals to business buildings, everybody wants their property. Okay, so what I'm trying to get at is let's just put this to an end. You guys, I mean, I appreciate all five of you that you guys are here. There were six of you earlier. I appreciate that I see all of you guys are here because that means I got more than almost half of you guys to hear and understand where I'm coming from, that let's just put this thing to an end so that later on down the line that we don't come over there and we just get a news from the mayor that, oh, Eagle Lake now is going to become a building and we're going to put a, some kind of building there because uh, the government wants to uh, do something with it. How about the people of Timunin, man? We deserve it. We have enough buildings there. Just tell us where you want a building and we'll figure out the rental space for you. I mean, all of you guys have ties to Timunin, okay? And I wouldn't take time out of my life and my work if I didn't think this was important. And I, I truly believe with uh, good community efforts and our good mayor, we can find, put our community efforts to developing that property. Because nobody did, and I'll be darn right now if I see somebody come out now and say, well, wait a minute, the government wants to transfer that now, so, you know, they're going to try to get the interest in that. No way. I give you my word, it will never happen. Okay, I will chain myself to that ground over there and say, you know, I have a lot of uh, life there, man. I mean, I was the morning, uh for LBJ, when my daughter went to uh, LBJ, I was the PTA president there. I've been a PTA uh, person for uh, Timunin Elementary. I've seen all my friends, kids go from St. Anthony to go use the field down there. So Timunin really benefits from that, and that's what this piece of property is all about. Who's gonna benefit from it? And I truly believe that the people of Timunin deserve this. You know, I mean, like I said, you know, when I, when I sat in Santa Rita and Sinanya, I said, wow, man, in the middle of the night, I can watch a baseball game. Why can't I enjoy that in Timunin? Okay, I think I got your point. <laughs> so, you know, Senator, I, I, I just want you to know something that I learned a lot from you. And I really believe that you're gonna do the right thing and help me get this passed and give it to our mayor's office. Okay. Thank you. Um, Senator, do you have any questions first? Um, I, I just a uh, cu couple of questions. First of all, uh, Mr. Borja, does the CLTC has they have they taken this matter up and at their commission meeting? Is there a board resolution uh, basically um, agreeing to turning this over? No, they have not. We haven't been able to meet for the last three uh, months, but we are scheduled for a meeting tomorrow. Okay. Um, 
has a formal request, I mean, aside from the bill, has a formal request been submitted by the mayor's office to the commission uh, basically asking for that property? Yes. There has been. And finally, now there's two lots here that we're talking about, right? There's the large baseball field, and then there's the one in the front where the blue store is. Now, is that is the owner of that blue store a CLTC lessee? No. <laughs> no, somebody was just allowed to use this property, and when, so we've asked them to vacate. So the building exists, but the, the business is, is not in use anymore. Okay, can you speak a little more into the mic? Can you? I'm sorry. No, that building does not is not has not been leased out to anybody okay so if this property is turned over to the jurisdiction of the mayor's office then the mayor's office will basically have this building that could be used for an office or whatever is that correct correct but the but what i tried to mention in this bill or in my testimony is that that portion of that property where that blue house is at that blue market is actually part of the same lot that incorporates the two elementary schools, so it needs to be severed out. Uh -huh. And then that part of the school, the I think it's Tumuni Elementary, um, it needs to be dedicated back to the Department of Education. If this, um, if this, if these lots are turned over to the jurisdiction of the mayor, um, would it have to be clear in the bill that it is for purposes of a multi-purpose uh, recreational sports facility? I, I guess what I'm getting at is once it's turned over, does the mayor's office have any plans to lease out that blue store and make that be a revenue generator? That was not the intent. That blue store was not supposed to be there like that. Um, when they first came to request um, um, to use that property, it was for a vegetable stand, open air. I was the vice mayor at the time, so of course the mayor had the full authority to um, grant whatever it is he wanted and he got the permit. Uh, but um, to my understanding, it's supposed to be an open vegetable stand, and which was great for me, I signed off on that because it was security for the children, the kids, um, the people that use the place. It was extra eyes and ears and, you know, um, protection or a place for uh, those who use the field where they can go and um, use the phone to call their parents or whoever. So I was happy about that. Um, getting as far as it did with it being enclosed, I was not happy at all with it. And um, so at this time, I've been in communication with with um, Chamorro Lantras, talking to them about it. And um, because they seize operations, we also had wanted them to, um, you know, the owner, to remove that building. Um, our plan to develop it, you know, is to, of course, make it, uh, you know, uh, we are in need of a press box, um, concession stands. Uh, we need to upgrade the restrooms there. There are so many plans that we have for our community. Um, we, you know, we're the business capital of the island. Um, you know, the, with all the revenue that they have there, a lot of the businesses and the, the homeowners around there, you know, they expect that of us to make sure we develop it, you know, and um, do it right for our community. So that's what we're looking at. Um, with that property now, we're, we're going to, our municipal planning council has put it on hold until it is uh, turned over to us, uh, you know, um, correctly. Okay, fine. Senator Spaldon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to make a couple comments and corrections on that. Mr. Italic, my wife, you're right, you know, has ties to Tumuning. I have longer ties to Tumuning than she does. Uh, I, I've been there for 53 years, have been a 53 year, 54 year resident of Tumuning. So I just wanted to say that. And my only disappointment was that I wasn't and, asked and to be I part of the And I know your brother runs the Windies, eh? so. Well, that, no, I'm just, I'm just trying to establish that I played baseball on that field. I marched on the drill team uh, in, in the basketball court. I, I, again, 
did all the activities down there. I just, I'm just mentioning. No need to comment. Yeah. I'm, I'm just and, telling and, you. And I just, for your information, I was, I was living in Tamuning when there was Tommy's Bakery. <laughs> that was still down there. That's how far. <laughs> Mr. I go. Chairman. That's right. So, so since we're on that note, if I could, I felt left out there, Mr. Atley. Uh, first of all, before I was the son of Aragada, I was a baby in Tamuning. It was the CCB Apartments, Castro Conception Beneventi, right behind the bowling alley. That was uh, the fun to Martin Beneventi's family. We lived there when my dad got out of the Navy. And just one more last point, Mr. Chairman, I did lose many a game to the Tamuning Eagles in Eagle Lake. <laughs> You know, that's, all right, you know okay, what, all right, just, okay. can I just make a Senators brief comment? That's why I'm just saying this now. You see how we can sit here and all laugh about this? Okay. How about we sit down there and we watch a good baseball game in the middle of the night? No, okay, have a hot okay. I do have a couple questions. Right. I do have a couple questions. Uh, Madam Mayor, or maybe even Mr. Boy, you can answer this. The, I mean, we, we identify it as a baseball field and the eagle field and whatnot back in the day. The basketball court, is this part of the footprint? Because I always wondered about that. Is the basketball court, that outdoor basketball court, is this part of the footprint? Yeah, that's part of the footprint on the lot known as 2-R2. Okay. Right. And, and I have, and, and I definitely am in total support of this bill. I, I know that even the tennis court's down there, it's being used and transformed, and it was actually put, uh, is now as a skate, uh, skateboard park. And even that, I, I have gone there and talked to the skaters down there, the boarders down there, and they're the ones who actually put that one together since the tennis court was not in use. And they were even asking for help. But because of the dilemma of who owns it and who has jurisdiction, that was always a problem. And, you know, and I would love to see, again, the whole field uh, be, be utilized for the residents of Tamuni. Uh, Mr. Tadek, you're correct. There is no other property in, in our district, in the Tamuni, Tumon, Harmon district, uh, government property, that can accommodate the sporting, uh, uh, the sports field and the uh, athletic fields that are necessary. Uh, and I would imagine, and one of the dismays that I do have is one of the things we don't have anymore that we used to have a lot of would be the baseball teams. We, our little league teams seem to be no longer existent. Um, you know, even some of the basketball, well, the basketball has moved down to right beside the mayor's, mayor's court. But a lot more activities can happen. We are one of the most populated uh, villages on our island, uh, maybe not in well, in landmass, definitely, but more so in population because there's a lot of R2 property. There are a lot of kids who have nothing to do or nowhere to go in the evening. And back in the day, that was the main hangout for all the children, all the young people of the village. And I would like to see that revived so you have my support on this bill. But again, I believe the, the director pointed out corrections are going to need to be made to make sure that this bill is appropriate appropriately designating the properties, both at Tumuning Elementary School and LBJ. I believe there's a portion that belongs to LBJ. I don't know if some of that property needs to be allocated to LBJ, but it would go back to Department of Education anyway. And that would probably be the only uh, 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 correction or amendment that needs to be made to this bill. Thank you, Mr. Spe uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Spadon. Vice Speaker. Thanks. Um, Mr. Bora and, and Mayor, thank you. Can you just help me out on the on the um, diagram that you passed out? I guess it's an aerial aerial shot. So the black lines on the front. Uh, why is that property? I mean, sorry. So you've got the big lot with the school, the other school, and then the lot below that, or the black lines below that. What 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 is that showing? Well, the, the school actually is supposed to be on their map, encompasses, the lot encompasses both those schools and that blue building. And is this, is this I'm sorry, white uh, spot, the blue that building? That white spot there that has its own separate box? Yes. That is a GTA uh, building, oh, okay. which has a separate lease. Okay, so the blue building is above that? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry, you're looking that's at the black and white one, so it's a darker roof, okay. but yeah, that's the blue building. Okay, great. And, and what is behind this big field? Is that also Chamorro Land Trust land? Uh, yeah, there's a the, the, in the green in the the area where the jungle's at. Yes. There's a pit back there, a coral pit. Is that pit. a coral pit? Yeah. So it's this private land. is adjacent to the coral pit. Yes. And who owns the coral pit? Cristobal family. Oh, okay. What about um, the the 
jungly looking area between the school and the cleared baseball field area. That's also yeah, part that's, of the crystal bowl. Uh, no, no, that's the skating area, according to the mayor. A planning basin and uh, there used to be a skate rink mm -hmm. um, back in 1990. It was developed by Mayor Alfredo Dunca at the time when we had the four backstops put up, the bleachers, yeah, mm -hmm. and they did a skate ball, but it was, it ended up being um, a pond, no drainage, a pool for frogs. Nice. Yeah. Okay. All right, yeah, I was also um, wanting to know if you intend to use these, this property, Mayor, for recreational purposes, and could we specify that in this bill, that it's going to be used for recreational purposes? Um, it's really not specified what the use would be. And would, would you agree to that? Uh, yes, um, the, oh, because it's a multi-purpose field and you know, it even shows here that, you know, for over 30 years that we've, you know, we always thought it was under our jurisdiction right. until Mr. Borja said it's still on their listing, you know, so, um, but yes, it's for all village youth activities, recreation, um, egg hunts, you know, just uh, for the community. All right, but you don't intend to commercially lease it out or? or no, not at all. Grant permits. Okay, what about... Um, would DOE be allowed to use it also if they needed They DOE? do all the time. Mm -hmm. Same with the private schools. All right. A lot of times St. Anthony um, and then other schools that need it use it for a home field. Vice Their Speaker, I, I think Section 3 addresses your concern about the use of the facility, of the field, the property. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, Line there. 10. Line okay, great. Thank you. And, um... Oh, so we don't have the Municipal Planning Council's resolution, I guess, if um, we could just get a copy of that. And I was wondering, does the Municipal Planning Council make a plan for this area? Is there some kind of draft plan? Uh, not at this time. Um, we did discuss it, and we're waiting for legislation to move forward first. And um, But we we do talk about you know, developing, especially um, now with the, the the gaming funds that are out now, and now we're able to do something and a little if, bit. Is there, what are the recreational facilities does Samuni have besides the, the gym? We all, the gym, and then we have the outside basketball and tennis courts. Right, adjacent to the gym. Right. Yes, okay. Is that it? That's it. I'm um, right. that, and then um, they're in between the two schools. This. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. You're welcome. All right. Thank you. Um, Senator, do you have any questions? None. None? Okay. There being no further questions, we'll consider Bill 161 34 as having been duly heard. Um, we have exhausted the agenda, and, uh, and so uh, we'll deem this public hearing, will adjourn this public hearing. And uh, one moment, please. And so this, this hearing is adjourned and the time is 11.01. Thank you very much.